I would like to welcome everyone to uh, this session, Emerging Challenges for Rural Recovery Support. And uh, my name is Pastor Greg Delaney, and to get today with us is Reggie Robinson and Lamont Sapp. I'll have them introduce themselves here in just a second, but just want to let everyone know that we are recording the session, and, uh, and we will have that posted out and available. So when talking about these emerging challenges and opportunities in rural recovery support in Ohio, one of our fastest growing incarceration population are women from rural communities. Uh, in rural communities, recovery services were limited prior to COVID-19 and now access to recovery communities and services is even more challenging. So today, Reg, today Southeast Ohio's Reggie Robinson, um, and uh, Lamont Sapp are both going to uh, share insights on navigating some of these emerging challenges in rural recovery and some simple steps that perhaps uh, communities can do collaboratively uh, to increase accessibility to recovery services for rural returning citizens. And so we'll start with a quick introduction. I'll, I'll start with you, Reggie, if you could just introduce yourself to the, to the attendees and then I'll uh, go to you, Lamont, next, okay? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Reggie Robinson. I'm community coordinator for Health Recovery Services. Uh, Health Recovery Services is celebrating 45 years of serving southeastern Ohio with uh, tra treatment services and prevention services. We provide uh, two inpatient treatment facilities and we provide outpatient services in six counties in southeastern Ohio. Thank you, Reggie. And Lamont, if you would be so kind to introduce yourself. Yes, thank you, uh, Pastor Delaney. I'm Lamont Sapp. I'm with the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, uh, Correctional Recovery Services. Um, we do the work in the Department of Rehabilitation and Corrections, and what that looks like is that um, I oversee a team of recovery services professionals in five of the prisons, state prisons in the southwest region of the state of Ohio. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome to you both. We're excited to hear from you and learn from you today. Um, so we'll kind of get started. And as I mentioned, we'll, we'll do a bit of a guided discussion and, and then uh, save some time for your questions toward the end. Um, one of the most reported consequences of the current pandemic uh, has been a significant uptick in overdose rates. Um, Reggie and Lamont and I were both, uh, and we were all talking a little bit about that prior to our session getting started today. Um, I live near Montgomery County, Ohio, and we're up about 25% in overdose rates. And um, we, we attribute that to the pandemic. We actually call it the epidemic within the pandemic. Um, and so what we've seen is with that, the, we've had a withdrawal of some recovery services not meeting in person uh, within recovery communities. And then clearly the additional trauma and stress that COVID has brought to all of us uh, have been given as, as two drivers for the spike in relapses. I do know from a um, high mental health and addiction services perspective, we do have a surge team in place that uh, is doing some things in, in, loop, in anticipation of this continuing, uh, this surge continuing. But, um, you know, I think what we, what we want to do is, is make sure that we're aware that uh, COVID is having a negative impact uh, in our recovery community. So state and national research shows that within our correctional institutions, a significant number of our incarcerated neighbors are in need of recovery support. So what's being done in collaboration with uh, the correctional facilities to provide the recovery continuum of care from institution to community? And Lamont, I'll start with you. Uh, can you give us some insight uh, from your perspective on that question? Yes, yes. Okay, so there was a time when someone was released into the community and, you know, they were given their state pay, you know, it, maybe let's say back in the day when state pay was $75, they were released back into the community, taken by a van, dropped off at the Greyhound station, uh, and on to whatever city they were living in. So since then, things have significantly progressed. Uh, for example, when I talked about the fact that I work for mental health and addiction services and I do that work in rehabilitation and corrections, that is because 
Correctional Recovery Services has always worked in the prisons. Uh, we were DRC, uh, Rehabilitation and Correction employees. However, um, back in 2015, we were lifted from being Rehabilitation and Correction employees and shifted to being Mental Health and Addiction Services employees. It was called a lift and shift. It was something that the governor uh, kind of arrived at through discussions with cabinet members and they arrived at the fact that they were serving the same population. You know, in fact, most of the uh, incarcerated population is also the mental health and addicted population. So that said, we set up a continuum that involved people that had connected with us through uh, ALD treatment services, through alcohol and drug treatment services, and through mental health services, those people the continuum would be that our OMAS employees, our mental health and addiction services employees, not only serve them while they're in the institution, but our counterparts also serve them as part of the continuum uh, transitioning back into the community. So what that looks like is uh, we have what we call linkage staff that come into the institution. Those people that have been receiving services in the institution kind of assess what their ongoing needs might be and then provide a linkage platform between them and community providers. So in, in a good handoff, uh, an individual has either met face-to-face -face with a community provider or at least they have an appointment with a community provider upon their release for continued services. Okay, well, that's great. Reggie, from your perspective as a provider, what, what are you seeing in terms of the collaboration between correctional facilities and, and the services that you provide? What we have seen is um, an increase in those uh, linkages that uh, Mr. Sapp was, was talking about, um, certainly at the uh, prison level, uh, but increasingly at the county level. Um, there are you know, great services being provided at the prison level, and we have uh, we work closely with Sean Stover, with the uh, reentry task force here in southeastern Ohio. Um, but we have a lot of people who end up uh, in our county systems and in the county jails, and that uh, the, those, those services are emerging. But we don't have nearly enough coordination with people who are in the. Uh, we've got a regional uh, jail here that uh, gets people from you know, our, our region. Uh, and they're, they have varying uh, sentences there. Some of them are going on to um, some of the secured recovery facilities like STAR, et cetera. Some of them are coming right back out in the community without the benefit of those state services. And so what we've had to do is cobble together uh, partnerships on the, the local level to work with those, those people and get them back into our communities and provide resources, et cetera. Some of them are pretty uh, much recidivists. Uh, they're in and out. And, and so uh, we see them pretty frequently. Uh, again, we're developing those services. I uh, just want to share early on, I'm a person in long-term recovery from substance use disorder myself. Uh, I've been 33 years uh, continuously clean and sober. And so I have um, definitely a special um, interest in working with these populations. I've never been to prison, but I've, I've seen the inside, you know, during my active addiction, I've seen the inside of a lot of county jails uh, during my active addiction. And so I know that the services there just weren't, you know, certainly 33 years ago, weren't what they needed to be. And so um, I volunteer with the, the uh, um, our, our local um, regional jail and do 12-step uh, meetings there. Uh, and it provides, uh, you know, a, a, a natural segue to when they're coming out, you know, hey, I'll see you at this, at the Wednesday night meeting, I'll see you at the Friday night meeting, I'll, you know, um, you have a sponsor, I can recommend somebody. Um, I, you know, because of my desire to keep giving back, I got certified as a peer recovery supporter. So, you know, I work it uh, in that way. And we're working with uh, peer recovery supporters at our agency, our Boards of Alcohol, Drug Addiction, and Mental Health Services have uh, set that as an area of focus. And so we're doing everything that we can to try to ease that transition. Uh, but again, uh, the infrastructure is still being built 
on the local and county level. Thank you for that. With the pandemic, and this, this is a little off, off script, but um, how, how have you leveraged some of the telehealth capabilities in, in, in bridging those gaps a little bit? Lamont, have you done anything with that? Well, I can maybe speak to that uh, in terms of how, um, I wouldn't say that for now, that has increased our capacity, that has been somewhat our fallback, um, so to speak. For example, uh, with the institutions having the pandemic also taking place in there, we have institutions that are have positive cases. We've lost lives of, of state employees and lives of offenders. Uh, so there are significant precautions that are in place uh, right now, uh, we don't have volunteers coming back into the prison. Um, you know, there's, there's limitations on services, there's limitations on movement, and this varies from institution to institution. So we've had to utilize the virtual platforms as a fallback, uh, whereas we can't, in some cases, meet with people face to face. And even with those linkage uh, situations, those have uh, been impacted. Uh, because the linkage staff may not be able to get in and meet with that person face to face. And um, so in some cases, it may be a conference call or it may be a virtual where they can see each other uh, over the screen, or it may be just that they have to have an appointment. Uh, but what I will say is that all, all of what we've had to do uh, as alternatives, I think moving forward, these things will serve us to increase our capacity to meet the needs by adding these alternative methods to what would be our normal practice moving forward. How about you, Reggie? What have you seen? Well, I, I will tell you, um, Pastor Delaney and, and Mr. Sapp, uh, that seemed like the, you know, the solution to, to the issue. Okay, we're quarantined, we're cut off from personal contact, et cetera, we're social distancing. So, why don't we just go telehealth? And uh, I, we really appreciate the uh, uh, Ohio uh, Department of Mental Health Addiction Services for increasing the access to telehealth and easing some of the rules that uh, made it, you know, sort of difficult to uh, to do telehealth initially. And we we increased our access. We, you know, uh, cross trained everybody on the platforms and et cetera. But we're in rural southeastern Ohio. And so we have a, an infrastructure problem. I'm going to probably say that word 50 times today. Uh, so, we, you know, you, you can't assume that people have Internet access or that they have Internet access or the bandwidth to um, access the platforms. And so we kept running into that. You know, what about that population that doesn't have Internet access, doesn't have a laptop, you know, or a tablet? Uh, to, to access the telehealth services. We can't leave them out. And, you know, so we're running into the um, uh, twin problem of increased need and decreased access all at the same time. So we had to do a lot of adjusting on the fly. And I have to give kudos to our staff who um, many of them, most of them, kept coming into work. Uh, even though, you know, we offered the option to work from home, they just, you know, their people are their people. Their clients are, are their people. And they uh, are just so dedicated. They were like, no, you know, my people are struggling. I got to do everything I can do to keep interfacing with them. So we set up socially distanced uh, uh, rooms, you know, therapy rooms uh, where they could um, come in socially distanced. Um, a lot of them uh, started meeting the clients in local parks, uh, you know, and, it, you know, maintaining confidentiality, et cetera, but, you know, some of the clients weren't comfortable with coming into the facility. So it was like, can you meet me outside somewhere? Uh, and our clinicians did that and, and are doing that. Um, so we did everything possible to continue serving people, um, you know, regardless of the, 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 the platform, whether it was face-to-face, -face, whether it was uh, online and what have you, we're continuing to do that. We have intervention programs that we went digital with, our prevention programs uh, went digital. But again, we had to make uh, some, some special uh, accommodation for those who didn't have that available to them. Yeah, 
and that, you know, I have the opportunity to kind of travel all over the country and talk a little bit about this. And it's not, it's not exclusive to Ohio. You know, we have our brothers and sisters right across the river in West Virginia. And some of the things that you just said you were doing, they're doing. There's uh, park meetings and, you know, being as creative as possible. And one of the things that we've seen here in our recovery community, and much like uh, Reggie, I too am a person in long-term recovery. Uh, what we've seen here was um, just uh, when we were able to get back together, it was so important, even if it was just under the 10 limit or in a park or just seeing face to face. Zoom, from my perspective, was a, a good stopgap for a minute, but you know it just doesn't uh, it just doesn't compare. And uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful that as we continue to move forward and and uh, and hopefully out of this pandemic. Uh, I, I think one thing that I, I came to, uh, I had an opportunity to, to do a sermon uh, back in July, and I, and I called it the Declaration of Interdependence. And I think if this thing is just anything, it's shown us our interdependence of one another and how important that is to our health and our, our ongoing, uh, you know, our, just our ongoing health and, and ability to kind of navigate life. Um, so as some of this equilibrium returns, as, as our health systems and the community, as, as some of that kind of gets back on balance, uh, Lamont, what do you see as the largest gaps for men and women who are leaving our institutions? Some of the largest gaps leaving the institutions. Uh, one, let me speak to those that leave the institutions that uh, while in the institution, um, you know, there are so many who don't even see themselves as having issues or concerns that should be addressed while they're in the institution. So many people in the institution are waiting for their time to be done. Uh, somewhat uh, of a mindset that I just need to serve my time. And um, there are many different um, things in the institution, different beliefs. There's these belief systems that, um, oh, you guys are only trying to offer these services because you're getting money for it, or, you know, you're getting so much money for every head that's in this program, things like that. And so there are so many reasons why people don't engage in services while there is a need for them to engage in services um, and they leave the institution with significant needs. And, you know, I'll, I'll self-disclose and let it be known that I'm a person in long-term recovery as well. Um, November, I'll have 21 years. Um, I'm also uh, a returned citizen. And I know that when I was incarcerated, um, you know, there's a stigma about, you know, having to be in treatment. There's definitely a stigma about standing in the line the mental health pill call line, you know, so just like in the community, there's so much stigma around the need to have services, even today in my church. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I'm very active in my church and one, one of the ministries that I'm over is the recovery ministry. And I know I have people in church that don't engage in the recovery ministry because it's for those people. It's not for me. It's for those people. Good job with those people, Mr. Sap, Deacon Sap. Good job with those people. And so the, the thing is, is I think starting from the community and, and, and going into the institutional environment, the stigma of needing some help is what often uh, prevents people from wanting to get help or seen in the place of needing help. And so we have a lot of people that return back into the community with a mindset of, hey, there's no way I'm going to get myself back in that situation again. Whew, after all I've just been through, I mean, I went through it myself. I left the institution after doing, on my second incarceration, I left the institution after serving over five years by the time I left the halfway house. And I only went to meetings because it was part of my probation. I got out on what they call super shock under the old law back in 1998, left the halfway house in 99, and I was only going to meetings because my probation officer said I had to go. As for me in my mind, I don't need this. Um, 
there's no way I'm going to do the things that put me in the situation I was in. Um, so we have that crowd of people and we have the people who have, we've offered them an opportunity to gain skills while they were incarcerated, uh, whether it been through mental health services, recovery services, and all the other reentry uh, programs. And just, mm -hmm. um, they, they cave to the pressures of their environment, their home life, their family life, uh, the pressures of, um, you know, having all these things that they have to deal with at once coming out the door and, and they go back to what they're familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Reggie, along those same lines, I mean, you serve six counties. Um, you know, what, what are the gaps for the men and women that are coming out that you see? Um, what, where, where are we uh, need to start filling some, some of those gaps? Yes. Well, I'm, I'm glad to see uh, Sean Stover uh, joining the, uh, uh, the room, uh, who's the uh, coordinator of the uh, reentry task force in Athens County. And I will say that Athens County uh, is uh, uh, more advanced in meeting those needs than some of the other uh, counties that we serve because of uh, the efforts of Sean. He's working tirelessly to uh, make those connections. And uh, Sean, um, feel free to uh, uh, unmute and jump in uh, here because you're the real expert. But one of the things that we see is a need for housing for recovery-oriented housing, for supportive housing. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Sapp mentioned that stigma. That stigma is alive and well. And uh, we had a situation um, not all that long ago uh, where um, reentry housing, there was an organization that was uh, looking at recovery and reentry housing, and uh, the um, neighborhood uh, committee came out strongly against it, and um, they ended up having to totally change their plans. They had identify the property and the whole nine yards, and um, they were um, forced to um, rethink that because the, uh, neighbor, the uh, neighborhood committee uh, just said, no, we're, we're, you're, you're not gonna be, uh, not in my backyard. Mm. And so the, the stigma and the, the uh, stereotype and, and uh, typing and all that is a, a huge problem. So housing is, is an issue, uh, employment is an issue. Uh, not only this, the stigma that uh, causes employers to be hesitant to hire re-entering uh, citizens, but also the, the, you know, the lack sometimes of the skills, just the basic skills of uh, getting through an interview, uh, just the uh, lack of, uh, of, of, of those, the, you know, uh, the work ethic uh, or not being used to it and what have you, uh, and not having uh, programs that are, are you know, preparing people for the workforce after uh, re-entering. Uh, big, uh, big issue. And another one is just um, recovery supports. Having those recovery supports, you know, if we do have somebody, and I appreciate what Mr. Sapp said, we do have a lot of people just complying because, you know, I got to go to these meetings and, you know, I don't, you know, it's part of my, you know, uh, requirements and what have you. But even for those who are, you know, taking recovery seriously and they come out looking for, you know, those recovery supports in some of our communities, we don't even have a meeting. Uh, and so they've got to you know, travel to another county to get to the meeting or another city to get to the meeting. Where's the transportation and all, all of that? Uh, and you know, so recovery supports uh, are a, a, a very much a need. And again, you know, our boards are, are emphasizing the role of peer recovery supporters. We just don't have enough of them yet. Um, one thing I want to mention on that, and it's not, um, I'm not complaining, please don't hear me as complaining, but uh, just, one of the issues with getting recovery uh, supporters certified is um, the record. Many of them do have a record and uh, the um, requirements the, um, uh, require them in many cases to have a cleaner record than they have. Uh, and I understand that to a point, but you know, people with nonviolent offenses, uh, I think that yeah, I really wish that those requirements were eased. We can have a lot more peer recovery supporters tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you know. I, I and as I might mention to you guys, I, I I'm in Nevada today, and I'm actually in a recovery community organization uh, doing this broadcast today with you folks. And um, one thing that that Nevada has done a really good job with is peer recovery coaching and peer recovery supports. Uh, we were in one of their other RCOs in Reno just uh, yesterday, 
And, um, you know, and, and I, I think the ability to get certification, the ability to uh, kind of get on the ground and, and, and start to do the work and help uh, is a little less cumbersome. But, and, and as a result, they've seen incredible success with it. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no question that peer recovery support is an effective means uh, to helping someone on their journey. And, um, you know, so I, I concur. I, I, I wish we would have, have more of that. And, and hopefully, and I think it's, it's trending that way, where we're going to see some, some movement in that, in that way to, to help take away some of the cumbersome nature of, of getting that done and, uh, and creating a greater availability of peers. I, I believe that's on the horizon. And that kind of pushes us into the, the next question. You mentioned peer supporters and what, what are some other things that, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic. We talked a little bit about telehealth. We've talked a little bit about recovery supports. What, what are some other trends that uh, you two are seeing uh, in the world of recovery, you know, just in uh, accessing, you know, maybe new services or services that are evolving? Um, you know, what, what are you guys seeing in that regard? I'll start with you, Lamont. Okay. So, Coming out of the institution and going into the community, again, being part of the recovery community myself, and I also have a uh, sober house as well. So I have guys that are in my sober house and friends of mine that are in the recovery community who right now are struggling because of not being able to have that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, a lot of meeting venues are not available to us right now. And so um, there are people who are actually receiving treatment, you, you know, via the virtual platforms. There are people who are engaging in 12-step meetings via the virtual platforms. However, the, what I'm hearing from people is it's not like going into a room, giving everybody a handshake, giving everybody a hug having the meeting before the meeting, having the meeting after the meeting, uh, going out for coffee afterward. Um, so I think as much as possible, um, community entities, churches, or whatever type of business that you're connected to, I think as much as possible, we have to allow these spaces for people to be able to engage like that. Um, like for example, if you're a church and if the 12-step community has not reached out to you yet, maybe you should reach out to them. Um, you know, if, if you're a church and you don't have a recovery ministry, maybe you should have a recovery ministry. Um, you know, maybe you should look at uh, what, is the, what is the recovery ministry? Um, celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery, yeah. Yeah, very good. That's a very good curriculum, very good ministry. Um, so there's, there's a lot more that we need to continue to do in community to uh, support uh, where we have these gaps uh, due to the pandemic. And then I think as we build out these alternatives, again, these are things that I think should stay in place as we move forward. You know, um, As we move forward, I love the idea of still being able to use uh, Zoom and, and the various tools that we're using now to increase what we are doing, you know? Um, but, but right now, that's, that's some of the biggest things people are facing, you know? That's why we're having an increase in overdose, we're having an increase in suicides, we're having an increase in overdose deaths, uh, because people are not able to engage like they're used to being able to. And I think along those lines, you know, uh, just kind of moving down through some of our guided discussion, you know, uh, just to build on that a little bit, Reggie, um, where do you see the, the best opportunities for uh, other community, you know, other members of the community to kind of come alongside what you're doing in your six counties um, to, you know, create um, uh, more services or collaborative services? What, what kind of things are, are you seeing as best opportunities for community members to come alongside and help do what you're doing? Well, if I could uh, respond to the other question first, yeah, sure. uh, and um, I, I really echo what uh, Mr. Sapp said uh, about the faith community having such a huge role. You know, when we talk about um, uh, addiction, you know, we're talking about a spiritual malady. And if the approach is, you know, lighting a, a spiritual approach, then we're only dealing with part of the problem. And I think our faith communities are uniquely equipped to make a difference. 
uh, with people who are frankly in despair. You know, uh, this I I have taken to saying, you know, kind of jokingly, you know, everybody asks, uh, "How you doing?" And you know, I you know I've taken to responding, you know. Uh, my go-to answer is, you ask a black man that in 2020. <laughs> you, you, you're seriously, you're asking me that, that in 2020. Uh, because, you know, I, I've, I've taken to not giving the, the standard, you know, fine answer. You know, no, we're not fine, right? If you're fine right now, you're probably not paying attention. You know, even those of us who have, you know, um, and I'm not complaining in, in any way, shape, or form. I'm well. You know, God is, is still on the throne, uh, you know, and I've got a job, I've got a wonderful family and all that. But 2020 takes a toll on all of us. And so, you know, those who are less blessed than, or, or less fortunate than I am, we're all blessed, but, you know, those of us who are less fortunate than I am um, are really, really struggling and really, really suffering. And um, we're, you know, I've, uh, fairly recently in the past couple of years um, educated myself more on suicide and become more active in dealing with uh, suicide uh, and you know, on the preventive side of things because I've lost uh, family members I've lost friends um, and you know it's all there's a nexus where all this is connected the, the substance use disorder the suicide the depression the anxiety uh, etc um, you know, some of the things that are bubbling up with racial issues in the country, you know, fastest rising group of uh, suicides uh, is uh, uh, black, young black children aged 5 to 12, especially males, 5 to 12, age 5 to 12. And, you know, so uh, it, it, we're getting hit, you know, the hits just keep on coming and they're coming from all angles. And um, understandably, people are overwhelmed. And so I'll tell you what, uh, one of the things that, that I see is that, you know, we, there aren't enough bodies to keep throwing at this. And we have got to, uh, I believe that we've got to get out of the mindset of, well, the, let the professionals take care of this. We all have a part to play. And, you know, it, 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 connection is the antithesis of addiction. Connection. And, you know, after, you don't have to have letters behind your name to make a connection with somebody to be just a little bit extra nice to them, you know, when you're socially distancing at the line at the super, supermarket or what have you, um, you don't have to have letters behind your name to check in on people in your web of influence. You know, you, not just your loved ones, we all do that, but people who, you know, you know maybe that person that you know, uh, you know, from the job or from uh, some other kind of social venue or whatever just calling and checking on them. Hey, how you doing? And I mean, how are you doing? You know, not, not don't, don't give me the, you know, the standard answer. I really want to know, you know, uh, uh, we kind of have this joke, never ask an old person how they're doing, you know, unless you got a few minutes because they will tell you, you know? <laughs> and, and so there's, there, there's a role that we all can, can play. And I'm, I'm maybe being a little simplistic about it, but I don't think it's all that hard. I think if we care enough, then those opportunities will present themselves to us. And it's up to me to, you know, not be too busy to take advantage of that opportunity to help someone else. And you just never know. Uh, you never know where that person is in their own personal despair. And that little bit of, you know, sunshine that you brought into their life might make a huge difference. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, when we're, we're talking about rural communities, um, you know, it's even tougher in, in those spaces because we're spread out, we're not together. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that anybody can do something. If, if we recall back, oh, it's probably a couple of months ago, uh, Director Chris uh, was on the, you know, the, the press conference with the governor that he's doing on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And, and they uh, talked a little bit about the Strive for Five. And the Strive for Five initiative was, you know, Take those five people from your phone, give them a call, see how they're doing, check on them. It yeah. uh, doesn't have to be elaborate. It's just this, uh, you know, you, you never know, like you said. It, and that call might have been the most uh, appropriately timed thing that, that they needed. And so I think that is something that, that we all can do. Um, 
Lamont, I want to ask you, you know, in terms of that, getting that read connection, you talked a little bit about stigma with those that are coming out of incarceration. Um, how can we do a better job as a community to kind of, you know, break that down and just uh, begin to see these folks as, hey, we, you know, they paid their debt, they're, they're coming back into our community, you know, how can we uh, welcome them differently? How can we help them differently? Um, what, what do we need to tell our communities to do that? Yeah, I think, I think it starts with not just looking at those, the identified patients, so to speak, not looking at those that are coming home from incarceration or uh, whatever the case may be, but I think looking at the people who are, for example, if we have churches that are uh, part of this workshop, for example, right in the church, I think we need to start tearing down those walls of stigma. We need to start, you know, for example, um, my ministry in the church is always, you know, whether I'm teaching Bible school, Sunday school, Bible study, Sunday school, recovery ministry, whatever it is, I'm always willing to put myself in that place, you know, put myself in that place as the person that's coming up short, put my place in itself in there as the place of the person that's the center, uh, the person that's in need of prayer, or the person that's in need of change, the person that's still struggling with this, that, or another. I think we live in a society where, for example, um, if you present as identifying with that, it's like, oh, you, oh, you, you still struggling with that? Um, you know, or if you really serious about the Lord, you, you wouldn't even be struggling with that, you know, and so the thing is, I think we have to make it okay to say, hey, I'm struggling, or someone's in my family struggling. I mean, we live in a society where people are even afraid to say that they're sick, almost as if you're not sick, you're bad. You, you got cancer because something's wrong with you. You know, people are ashamed to say, hey, I'm sick. Hey, I need help. People are ashamed to say that. And so we as a society have placed that pressure on people. And so when people can't even say they're sick, the first step of getting help, you gentlemen know this, is admitting that we have a problem. If we, if we live in a society where you, you're afraid to stick your head up and say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sick, that's a problem. That's a problem. So I think starting with not even looking at people that we want to identify as surely they have a need, let's start with everyday people. Let's start with ourselves and be the one to foster an environment that makes it okay for people to say, hey, I need some help. We have to foster an environment that, that makes people feel safe to say, yep, I still struggle in that area. You know, and, and, and I say it in different ways, like at any given time, I could have left my cross over in the corner. I just put any kind of example out there to let people know that I'm not ashamed to say that I have some struggles. And, and trust me, I, I am blessed. I mean, God has allowed me to live two totally different lives, you know. And so um, if you look around me and see you know, what my life is now compared to the life, you know, I'm the guy that, you know, walked the streets at some point in time, lonely, broke, tired, and hungry, still wishing I had some of what put me in that very predicament. If you see me then, and if you see what my life encompasses now, you would know I'm truly blessed. But even with that, I'm not so dignified. We shouldn't be so dignified that it's like, oh, I'm dignified and I'm sanctified and I'm filled with this and dipped in that. We shouldn't be so much of that that we can't say, yep, I still struggle with my attitude or yep, I'm still struggling. I know people who are in very uh, responsible roles or should I say have titles and they're struggling with all type of stuff, including the need for recovery. But if you can't get to step one and say, hey, I have a problem. And so if you want to take it even bigger, if you can't get to step one and say, I have a problem or our community has a problem, our community and the ills of our community, the ills of our society is now the, the child that the village needs to raise. You know, if we can't get to a place of saying there's a problem and what are we going to do uh, as a community to deal with it, then 
we, we're not even at step one. No, and, and to, to build on that a little bit, there's an organization called Shatterproof. It was started by a dad who uh, lost his son to addiction, overdose. And really, um, and the story that he tells is that there were two kids in, in, in the neighborhood. One child had cancer, the other child was uh, addicted. The community rallied around the cancer child. The community did not rally around this child that was addicted. And it's because of that stigma. It's, it's looking at it differently. I like what you said there about, you know, we, we look sometimes as, as this, is, this is just people being bad. No, addiction is a real thing that is a disease. It's an illness. And so we need yes. to remember that. And that, that, that in itself should stir us to compassion and, and a willingness to, you know, just step in and be available. I think one of the things that the recovery has taught me is that, you know, vulnerability is not weakness. Uh, I, I believe vulnerability is great strength. And it's, it's because we're, we're not designed to, to walk this thing out by ourselves. It's not, it's, not how we're, it's not how we're wired. But I do know that in the faith community, um, you know, those that uh, I'll encounter that, that may still be active in their addiction or they're seeking help, they don't find the faith community as a welcome place because there's no authenticity behind those walls. No, no, no folks wanting to be real about what they got going on behind those walls. And That's so right. We really need to, to take a, a strong move in that. i tell you a quick story. I was uh, in Hancock County uh, sharing with a, a church who decided to have a mental health day. And that was a Sunday morning. And uh, as they brought in um, the board, they brought in other providers in their community there in Finley. Um, the church service was all about uh, mental health. And the way that they did that is they had three folks from that church stand up and tell their struggle. One had struggled with uh, thoughts of suicide. Another was a family that were, uh, you know, finding their way out of a, a addiction. There was another person that had depression. And what was amazing is at the end of that service, and we talked a little bit about what the, the church could do and some of the things that I do. And uh, after those stories were told, there was a gentleman sitting in the back of that church that didn't go to that church, just happened to come into that church that day. He stood up and said, I need help. And what was amazing, it was because he felt comfortable after the others had said they, they, they needed help too. And what was really remarkable about that congregation was I, I loved the way they went about helping. Uh, they, of course, prayed for him, but they were connected to their recovery community and that one person was making the phone call to Midwest Behavioral Health to see if we could get him in. Another person was arranging the transportation. Another person was willing to talk to his family and say, you know, he's getting ready to go, you know, someplace to get some help. Another person was saying, hey, if we need to go get you some clothes, let's do that. But it all started, going back to your point, it all started with a, an environment of authenticity and an, an environment that said, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with that and, and a place where they could feel safe. Um, yeah. Reggie, you mentioned a little bit about body, mind and, and spirit in, in your work. Um, how do you incorporate that into your everyday uh, interactions with folks that are you know, coming out of incarceration, seeking services from you? How do you do that? Well, increasingly, we are utilizing the faith community as partners. Uh, I, I, I sit on the coalitions, uh, several coalitions in each of our counties. And uh, we, if we don't have uh, faith community partners, we actively seek them. And I'm uh, very uh, happy to say that we've got um, great participation from our faith partners in all, in all of our, our communities. Um, and, you know, uh, we were state funded. And so we're careful about things like proselytizing Etc. But you know, there's certainly, and and also about pushing one uh, denomination over another. But there are certainly spiritual principles that are universal, and that are applicable to you know combating that despair, and combating some of the you know anxiety, depression, yeah. etc. And so we are increasingly uh, whole, holistically centered. Uh, we do a biopsychosocial assessment for you know all of our clients that come into the program, and there's a spiritual aspect of that. And so we look at you know what kinds of uh, you know spiritual fulfillment they're finding in their life, whether it's you know uh, religion or whether it's meditation. Uh, you know there are lots of practices that we uh, are innovating in in our our uh, 
uh, clinics. We have um, our medical staff are uh, holistically oriented, and we've got uh, our, one of our doctors who is absolutely medication is a last resort. Uh, he's looking at all kinds of, of um, um, therapies and alternate therapies, uh, and you know uh, I think our clients are better off because of it. Also, in our approach, uh, we are as everyone has to be these days. We're trauma informed. And so we're, you know, really looking at uh, the trauma that our, our clients have gone through and are still going through. And uh, we, we do an ACE, um, you know, um, assessment, uh, you know, uh, adverse childhood experiences. Everyone knows about uh, that, uh, hopefully about that groundbreaking work. And we look at the, the trauma they've been through and, you know, work with them to uh, uh, walk them through that trauma, to address that trauma. Uh, and again, we do that with a, um, a, a spiritual framework. Uh, we may not even, you know, uh, in my work as a prevention specialist, um, I may not even say the word, you know, but it, in, my, in my approach, um, I'm absolutely, uh, you know, I, I may not even tell a, a, a client, you know, I'm praying for them, but I am. Uh, and, you know, and, I, and I'm, you know, maintaining my source of strength, which is Jesus Christ, you know. Uh, and I'm unabashed about that. Again, I may not say it out loud to them uh, because, again, I'm not trying to convert them or proselytize or what have you. But it's it's revolutionized my approach, and it's certainly you know uh, where my approach comes from. Uh, and you know there are all kinds of innovative ways that I think that we've got to um, fold that into what we're doing. Again, as I said earlier, if we're not you know having a spiritual aspect to our interventions. I think that we're missing out on a, a huge therapeutic tool. And I think our, our faith communities, um, with a little bit of education on you know what substance use is, a little bit of education about trauma, a little bit of education about an adverse childhood experience, you know, that that lay leader or that that champion that's in that church, uh, A, it can make that church a safe place for someone to seek some help, but also it be an informed place. And, and realize what their limitations are and be willing to say, hey, look, this is a little bit beyond my, my ability, but I, I want to connect you to Reggie and his group, and, and, and they, can, they can take it from here. I think every congregation, in, in my mind, uh, has, the, has the ability to do that. And going back to Lamont's point, uh, one out of three people in the state of Ohio are being impacted by this epidemic of addiction. Um, so just count them out in your, in your pews. You know, they're there. And, and yes. coming out of that are also your champions for, for change, the, those that can be a part of the solution as well. And I think that's sure. what we usually try to target and go find is that, you know, those, those folks that may have shared experience, maybe like us, uh, but maybe also are just folks that uh, understand what an empathetic approach is, helping them understand that. Um, you know, Reggie, you mentioned uh, adverse childhood experience. If, if anyone's on the Zoom that isn't familiar with that, uh, you can go out to YouTube uh, you can type in Dr. Nadine Burks, again, Dr. Nadine Burks on YouTube. Uh, she does a fantastic 16 minutes on adverse childhood experience. Uh, it's probably one of the most insightful and, and uh, succinct. It's great brevity, but you get a lot of content. There's a lot of meat in those 16 minutes if you want to learn a little bit more about that, because that's another thing to, to just build what you said so eloquently a lot was, you know, I think the number last I saw was, there's only 12% of the population that don't have any of those adverse childhood experiences. So we all got some stuff and, yes. um, you know, and, and some of us got a little more stuff than others, but That's we all, right. got stuff, you know, now, now pastor, I, I'd like to just yes. for a second touch on what you said about leaders, leadership in churches and, and any other organization that's in a place where they could uh, lend uh, a space, a space for healing, so to speak. Um, I think it's important uh, that they yield and understand that they don't have every answer. For example, my bishop, he is quick to say, hey, I don't know everything, but what I do is try to surround myself with people who can step in and be the expert in this area or that area. And I think um, that's important for leadership to do that. Good leadership is not knowing everything or having all the answers. Good leadership is utilizing the resources that you have available to you 
to move things forward. Uh, so, for example, um, I'm, you know, I keep thinking that we're having an excellent conversation, but we're talking about the rural area. And so we're talking about an area that if we're already challenged with people having the social distance, if we're already challenged with people not being able to go into different facilities, now we're talking about a bigger challenge when we're already spread out and less connected possibly in this rural area. So uh, one thing that I think about uh, as that comes to mind is that, for example, we just had a uh, community event between my church, another church, uh, the local elementary school was involved, some of the local businesses were involved and we had it in a centralized area. So, you know, my thought for a rural community, they're gonna have to pull together. They're gonna have to pull together because again, they're already spread apart and even more isolated now with, with this pandemic. So they're gonna have to pull together and say, hey, you know, we need the fire department involved, we need the police involved, we need some churches involved, we need people involved, and we need to do some things at a centralized location to help further meet the needs of the community. Yeah, this certainly is the, the all hands on deck time, um, you know, and, and, and that's, it's just so well said, uh, Lamont. Um, a couple things that I can say is that part of our efforts with Recovery Ohio and part of my efforts just uh, over the time that I've been in recovery and, and been so blessed to, to work with, um, you know, now Governor DeWine and, and a lot of other people. If, if we do have folks of faith on the call and, and your, your church wants to get engaged with some of this stuff, uh, we, we help you with that. That's part of what I do. And so we have uh, education for the church. Uh, we have um, best practices. We can give you some ideas. We do some uh, capacity analysis. We kind of also do some uh, congregational readiness um, discussion to see, you know, what you might have inside your congregation that you can uh, leverage and, and be able to be a part of that community-wide uh, solution. So I put my email in the chat. Um, feel free to, to email me on that. Uh, it's actually why I'm in Nevada today. Uh, doing some of that work. One other thing that we've seen uh, has been very helpful to our community when it comes to the stigma of substance use disorder is there's an organization, I'll put it in the chat as well, called Addiction Policy Forum. They're based, in, based out in DC. Um, they have some excellent, simple three, five minute videos about what's going on in a person's brain when they're dealing with substance use. Uh, what are the whirlpools of risk that someone, you know, how does someone get in, you know, engaged with this? How, how do they fall into that trap? Um, you know, so I would encourage you to, to go out there and take a look because in community meetings and faith-based meetings where I have been able to show some of those videos and share a little bit about the science, you can watch the light bulbs go off in the room of people who had a very distinct impression about what someone that's dealing with this you know, why they were dealing with it. And suddenly you kind of change that narrative and then suddenly they're like, oh, their, their perspective on that completely changes. Their ability to serve that person completely changes. And so we have that available to, to those who are on, on here. And, and so you can reach out to me and, and we'd love to, to share some of those resources with you uh, really in a, in, a, in a way just to empower you and enable you as a community person. You're here today because you're interested um, and, and if you have the church to go back to and getting them, you know, to, to engage and get connected. Um, we're kind of getting down to, uh, let me take a look at my time here. Um, yeah, we're, we're about at an hour. So I did want to open it up uh, to um, the folks on the, on the Zoom. Um, I am getting your chats. So if you want to put a question uh, for the folks in the chat, I'm, I'm happy to facilitate that and, and pass that along. Um, I did get one for you, Reggie, from Sean Stover, telling you that you are a huge part of their success. So I wanted to, to give you that, that little encouragement. But you can also unmute yourself and, and address our, our two experts here today. And uh, if you have any specific questions or comments that you'd like to make, let's take the last few minutes here and, and do that. I just, this is Sean Stover. I just have a comment. Go ahead. Um, yeah, you know, this has been probably one of the most heartfelt 
sessions I've seen, um, and it's like I'm start I'm starting to tear up during this, and I appreciate you all being as real as you are and sharing your wisdom and your information. It's been it's been uh, wow. It's we, we're going through some hard times, and you all hit the nail on the head when you when you talked about your experiences and how you're helping others. So I just want to give you a, a big positive shout out. Well, that's Thanks, awesome. Sean. Thanks, Sean. Sean, we love you. Thank you. I love you too, Reggie. You're the man. <laughs> Does anyone else have any comments or questions or like to address the guys? Well, gentlemen, I'm going to just ask each of you to kind of close out with just a charge to, the, to our folks that are on here of, um, you know, what, what you'd like to see from, from the community and, and just kind of share the last little bit of your, your heart on, you know, what, what, what you want to leave them with. And so, uh, Lamont, I'll start with you. Just, just what would be the message to our folks that are on here? What do, you want, what do you want them to walk away with today in addition to everything that we talked about? And then I'll ask you to do the same, Reggie, and then we'll kind of tie it up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if I was to charge you with anything today, it would be that you, you need to remember, I need to remember that the therapeutic value of one helping another is without parallel. I need to remember that iron sharpens iron. I need to remember that there should not be shame in my testimony. There should not be shame in my story. There should not be shame in my experience. In fact, I should be ready to give God the glory from bringing me from where he brought me from. All too often, we are afraid to let people know where we were at. And we lose sight of the fact that the glory is in talking about where God brought us from and where God brought us to. So I think, um, I can't really speak for God, but I think it's good to give God his just due for what he's done. Uh, God does that to encourage other people. Let your life be an encouragement to other people. Let your story uh, be the story that frees up other people uh, and helps them to understand that if God did it for me, he can surely do it for you. Um, people are hiding in the shadows thinking that they're the only one that's going through what they're going through. People thinking that they're unique, that surely there's something wrong with them because they're the only one that's going through that. So share your story with others and let them know that if God did it for you, he can do it for them. Amen, Lamont. Amen. That preaches all day long. Um, you know, I, I love what you said there. It reminds me of what C.S. Lewis says is that friendship begins often with the, the two words, me too. And it's because we, right. we aren't alone and we aren't unique. Reggie, what, what, what can you add and, and share with us as we close things out? Uh, I, I tell you what, Brother Sapp, I didn't leave much of anything to say. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an old hard shell uh, Baptist, you know, Baptist born, Baptist bred. When I die, I'll be Baptist dead. And sometimes all you can say is amen. That's what I learned, you know. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to say a big, huge amen to everything that, that, that you said, uh, brother, and everything that you said, uh, Pastor Delaney. Um, I, I will say this. Do not underestimate your worth in, in this struggle. Don't underestimate what you can do for someone else. Take care of yourself first. Self-care has never been more important. But you know what? We all have a part to play. And get creative. Do not limit yourself. There is no limit. The sky is not even a limit. When I first got into the uh, prevention field, I wanted so badly to make a difference in the lives of young people. And so I went out and, you know, started doing education and going into the classrooms and what have you. And I was putting them to sleep, Pastor Delaney. <laughs> I, was, I was trying my hardest, and they were just, you know, you could see them, their eyes glaze over when I'm giving this, you know, literally life-saving information. And so I, you know, I prayed about it. What can I do to get their attention and get them engaged with this information? And it came to me like a bolt of lightning. You know, music. Music is hugely important in their lives. And if you can harness the power of music, behind your message. And so long story short, um, I wrote a drug-free rap. 
And so I started going into classrooms and doing this old man doing a, you know, a rap. And it, 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 they, were, they were electrified. They were like, oh, my goodness. This, you know, and I would say, if you pay attention to the presentation, at the end, I'm going to rap for you. And they're like, I can't wait to see this. <laughs> and so out of that, um, you know, I, had, um, I was dropping my kids off at a middle school dance. And uh, the um, chaperones came out at, desperate. Uh, came after me and said, hey, Reggie, you've got this uh, musical equipment to do your, your rap thing and what have you. Can you DJ? I'm like, I'm just dropping my kids off at the dance. Like, no, we had to get rid of our DJ because the DJ was not suitable for the, the group. The DJ was on something and they fired him on the spot. And so I said, okay, I'll go home and get my equipment. And I did a dance for the, you know, my, my kids, you know, when they were in middle school. And um, it was a success. Next thing I know, another school's calling me, another school's calling me. And, you know, here, 30 years later, uh, Sean knows me as Rockin' Reggie. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Rockin' Reggie, the DJ guy. And so I go around to, you know, community celebrations and in the schools. And, you know, I'm just doing all kinds of stuff. I'm doing, you know, church celebrations and, and what have you, adapting the music to the, and it's a, it's a ministry. It's a ministry and it's a you know prevention program, and I was actually uh, even recognized by the Department of Education as having as my my DJ being a you know a program. It was accepted as an educational program, um, and so you know it, I, I say all that not to lift myself up, just saying that you know this is maybe the an idea you think is silly at the time, you never know where it's going to go. No, so man. every one of us has those skills and. And, um, you know, use them. Do not underestimate yourself. We can all make a difference. Yeah. Amen. You, you knew what was going to happen, Reg. You've gotten in the chat that somebody wants to hear a little bit of the rap. <laughs> yeah, Reg. I mean, I was, uh, yeah. I didn't want to be the one to put you on the spot. But, yeah, man. <laughs> uh, you, I, we were not going to do that today. But okay. thank you very much. <laughs> no worries. No worries. We'll have to. Make sure somebody records you sometime down the road. Yeah. <laughs> push that out. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for both of you. Grateful for your heart and your testimony and uh, grateful for the journey that you're on, Lamont. Uh, you truly are a, a fantastic example of what a restored citizen looks like. And uh, like you said, God's not a respecter of persons. If he did it for you, he can do it for anybody. And Reggie, right. what a delight you have been with your, just your, you know, just your energy and your gregarious and, you know, the whole rock and Reggie, you, you've got it going on. And I'm so grateful I got a chance to meet both of you today. Uh, for those who are, are on here with us, just to kind of wrap things up, um, you do, um, I want to remind you that you can find your next session on your Whova platform for today. Um, if um, we will be, you know, we did record this session and so it'll be posted up uh, once we get it all kind of put together and transferred over, you'll be able to see it. And I think it stays on Whova for about six months, if I recall uh, correctly, from, from Reba, our, our coordinator. So um, I did want to say uh, thanks again, and thank you for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, also, any uh, the information for Lamont and Reggie, contact information, all that stuff is in their profile on the Whova app, as well as mine. Um, so thanks to everyone and uh, just get out there and, and make that difference. Find what you can do and make that difference and, and it'll be awesome. Take care, everyone. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you, you so Pastor. much. Thank you, Reggie. You guys did a great job. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It was a very <laughs> robust discussion. Um, and I know that it looked like at the beginning that you didn't have